6 Jeep J10 and I bought it a couple of years ago thinking that it was pretty solid, should be pretty easy to turn into a reliable daily driver. Well, I got it into the shop, looked at it a little bit closer, and that's not the case. However, I'd like to do something about it rather than just let it leak on the lawn. So under the hood we have a 258 inline 6, which all indications are that this engine was actually swapped in from a 78 CJ5 at some point. As we can see, the fuel filter setup is a little bojang. There is also a lot of paint missing from the brake booster because the master cylinder is leaking, which is probably a large part of why the brake sucks so bad. Down here is an obviously missing exhaust manifold bolt, which I am sure is not helping regarding the many exhaust leaks. All of the wiring under the hood is hack, so there's a lot more work to be done there. Moving along, the gas tank busted out, so I just stuck this little bottle in here so I could fire it up and get it into the shop. This is absolutely not an ideal setup, and the fact I didn't bother to run the return line into it doesn't help either. There's also no battery hold down, a bungee really doesn't count, and the terminals are mismatched junk with rotting wires. Don't ever buy these ones that clamp the wire like this, they always just come loose. Oh, there's also no overflow for the rad. I'm pretty certain you're supposed to have that. The interior offers an odd collection of colors, torn upholstery, questionable floor pans, and a beautiful dashboard which, near as I can tell, not a single one of these gauges actually works. Moving on to under the truck, there's a TH400 transmission and a Borg Warner QuadraTrack transfer case. For people that don't know, the QuadraTrack is a goofy full-time four-wheel drive system that has no two-wheel drive position. This is the high-low range selector. And this vacuum switch locks and unlocks the central differential, which normally would be located in the glove box, but somebody moved it. The whole QuadraTrack system is odd, and parts aren't really available for it, so if I find any real issues here, I will have to consider making major changes to the drivetrain. Obviously, there's some leakage, there's a staggering amount of play in the shift linkage, and what's up with the way the crossmember is mounted? Moving to the back is where things start to actually get ugly. That's a Dana 44. Not a terrible axle, but look at those lift blocks. Actually, let's zoom in on them some. Not only are they homemade and welded together, they've actually been welded to the spring perch. So, that's no good. And what's also not good is that pinion angle. And there's a typical J-Truck problem here, in that the driver's side forward spring hanger is getting pretty rotten. In the front of the truck, we have another Dana 44, this time lifted with a spring over axle. But wait, did they even weld that spring perch on? Oh, not to worry, they did, with uh, bird poop. Hmm, so that's probably worth doing something about. Also concerning is that the brake lines must not have been long enough, because they just unbolted the brackets for them and let them flap in the breeze. Perhaps even more interesting, this truck has actually been shot. And if all of this isn't bad enough, the tailgate's also broken. That's pretty well where I draw the line on a pickup truck. You can't use it as a truck, it's not much good. So with the laundry list of things wrong with the truck, the question is, where do you start? Well, for me, the most inconvenient thing about this is the fact that it doesn't have a gas tank. Every time I go to move the truck, I'm splashing fuel everywhere, I'm making a mess, I'm risking a fire. So luckily, I managed to track down one of these. This is a newer style plastic gas tank for a J-Truck. I don't know if it's any good or not, it looks like it is. I don't know if it's a direct bolt-in or not, I guess we'll find out. Before getting too excited about this previously enjoyed gas tank, I figured I'd at least better pull the sending unit and take a look inside. Well, let's just say this is probably one of the worst sending units I've ever seen. I figured I'd treat it with some POR metal prep just to knock the worst of the rust off. I'll order a new one when I get the chance, as they're actually available and only about $40 US. Well, on to removing the gas tank. I simply cut off the supply and return lines, as I knew they needed to be configured differently with the new tank, and there was no sense fighting hose clamps that were hard to reach. The vent and fill hoses were also cut, as they were completely rotten anyways. From there, it was just a matter of attacking the rusty hardware that secured the single gas tank strap. The vice grips were necessary to prevent the captive bolt from spinning. And then I could drag the whole nasty mess out from underneath there. With the old tank out, I could do a quick comparison between the two. 
The old one had a large fill hole on the side, along with a smaller vent, and a setting unit that was installed through the top. The new one has a fill hole that's not much bigger than the vent, both of which are located in the forward corner, and the setting unit goes in from the front of the tank. On top is a hole for a vent or a rollover valve. Still different, the old tank used a single crusty strap, while the new one is clearly meant to take two straps, which I don't have. So in short, they're nothing alike. So with a reasonable idea of what I was up against, I got to it, first by throwing some 1.5 inch HSS scrap in the bandsaw, to make four of these little things, which were then trimmed down with the angle grinder to look like this. And the drill press was then put to work to add appropriately sized holes, and some nuts were welded captive in them. Then it was just a matter of the unpleasant task of attempting to remove enough rust to be able to weld these new brackets on. Don't worry, the brake line I was bumping with the flap wheel will be replaced in short order. And while I don't really preach safety, you will notice I'm wearing a full face shield respirator. They're well worth the money. As a last thing, a spot was cleaned for the ground clamp. Next up was wiggling myself back under the truck and giving her my best shot at trying to make some awkward welds look okay and be structurally sound. I really do hate welding under a vehicle and I wish I had the truck on a rotisserie. Maybe on a future build. You never know, something nicer than this might justify it. I then could slip the tank into place and secure it temporarily with a ratchet strap. Then I could do a little bit of measuring, which led to this precision diagram. This was all laid out on some 1 8 by 1 half inch flat bar. The end holes were drilled first, then the sharp bends were formed with a soft hammer in the vise. From there, the larger radius bends were hand formed using some scraps of pipe as work aids. Obviously an actual metal former with proper dies would have worked better, but this is what I had. I then test fit the strap and marked for some clearance issues on the sum. Which I then removed with the angle grinder. As the long tab on the back side would not likely be strong enough, some small angle braces were cut out for this area. Some scrap was used to shim the brace to the correct height, and it was welded into place. And here's the finished product. Of course we need two. They're not perfect, but they will do. So, time to put the tank in? Well, not quite. I figured I'd better change some brake lines out first. As you can see, I prefer using my Nipex for this rather than flare wrenches. I find they actually grip far better. Unsurprisingly, most of these fittings were seized, or the B-nut jammed to the line so I cut some of them off rather than bothering to play nice. From there, I just unbolted the lower end of the hose from the axle and simply cut the line off from up top. Of course, the hose retaining clip was long rotten, so it broke off. The easiest thing to do at that point was to finish it off with a cold chisel. Moving towards the front of the truck, the bolt cutters were back out. They made short work of that line for now. The section ahead of this was actually well preserved by oil leakage, so I figured I'd just leave it be. As is always the case when you're working on a vehicle that was a project of somebody else's, you'll find small things that could have potentially big consequences. In this case, this little bolt here that's used to hold the distribution end of the brake hose onto the axle is the wrong size. And there's no threads in the hole in the tube anyways, they've been ripped out. This would very likely lead to water getting in the axle, which could easily lead to destroying the gears, the bearings, everything else inside of it. At the same time, this vent hose is actually too short. It never got lengthened when they lifted it. And as you see, it pulls right out of the tube. Because of this, I'll put a longer vent hose on and I'm going to weld up the hole for this bolt, and then I'm going to put a stud on instead that I can then guarantee will not cause contamination.
I figured I'd better tap some real threads into the vent hole and put a proper fitting in it. With that out of the way, the new rear brake hose could be installed. I use this hose a lot. It's from a 96 Dodge Dakota and it's about 23 inches long. However, it's a 3 16 inch diameter, so an adapter is needed at the upper end since that line is quarter inch. This won't affect function. Then it was just a matter of feeding a new line into the missing section. Since this is only quarter inch line, it's easy enough to just gently bend it by hand. Maybe this method isn't as professional as it could be, but let's face it, not much about this project really is. The same process was used for new lines on the axle. That longer vent hose was installed at the same time. I like using these little cushion clamps to secure the lines, and I may add one to over top of the diff cover later. A little tip for making sure you can get these lines apart later is to put some anti-seize on the inside of the B-nut as well as on the threads. Make sure you make a really big mess while doing this, as that's important too. With all this done, I figured it was time to finally install the tank. Of course it was filthy inside, so I vacuumed it out the best I could. Then I used a little assembly fluid to stick the setting unit o-ring in place. This stuff is very tacky, but will not hurt o-rings or contaminate whatever fluid is in the system, so it is very handy for awkward installations like this. Then the broken sending unit can be installed, as it's only going to be used as a pickup for now. I tried to install the old vent valve, but was having no luck as the grommet was rock hard, and the local parts store didn't have one, so I boiled it to soften it up, then lubed it with silicon grease to aid install. This is a great trick to deal with hardened seals, and if boiling it in water didn't make it soft enough, I would have boiled it in synthetic oil. I intentionally didn't try to make the tank straps an exact fit. Rather, they're short so they can be tightened as much as needed without bottoming. This meant bolts would not be a great way to secure both ends of the straps, as it would be awkward to prevent the bolt from coming loose. So I cut down some all-thread to make studs for the rear mounts. These I installed using the standard double nut method, and locked them in place with another nut. Then it was just a matter of jamming the tank into place, and getting all the hardware done up to the appropriate tightness. and I used a double nut to lock the straps at the rear. So now it's just a matter of hooking up the filler, which should be easy, right? It's just running a hose from the neck to the tank. Well, no, of course not. The size of both the fill and vent hoses are different, and I couldn't come up with the correct reducers locally. So I started with a two and a quarter to one and three quarter inch exhaust reducer and a one and a quarter inch hose bar. I cut these both down like this. I also cut both a 1 inch and a 3 quarter inch hose barb in half. Then it was just a matter of welding all these things together. And wow, not winning any awards with this, but it will work. And I even welded the inside to ensure it would be leak free. Of course it turned out that the rest of the vent hose, here, was completely rotten and would have to be entirely replaced. And to get access to that hose was going to take a little messing around as the dry box was in the way. Luckily it's only held in with a couple J bolts, so no big deal. And then this cover had to go. But there always has to be one that's just gonna break off. And then finally, well, these had to go too. But whatever they were, they hadn't been used in years and certainly won't be missed. Then it was just a matter of jamming in a new vent hose, the adapters, the new fill hose, the other half of the vent hose, and then the actual feed and return lines. As another quick tech tip, if you're going to be working with large diameter hose, get a set of these hose cutters. They work amazing. Finally, time to deal with those pesky front brake hoses. Well, it turns out the ones I ordered were actually way too long, so for now I'll just secure the brackets on the lower hole. This is a good interim solution. As you can see, I'll have to replace the lines later anyways, given the amount of rust on them. This very minimum effort means at least the lines won't vibrate until they break off. For the master cylinder, I used my usual, being the Nipex to break the B-nuts free, and then spun the lines off with a wrench.
And as any good manual would say, the installation is the reverse of the removal. Oh, and the master cylinder on this is the same as a Chevy K10, so you can actually buy them and they're quite cheap. Always remember to add fluid before attempting bleeding, otherwise it just doesn't really go that well. The next easy step was wedging a random piece of what was formerly a 2x4 onto the brake pedal, then cracking bleeders and repeating until only clear fluid came out, using the standard method of starting with the rear right and working away around to the front left. As a disclaimer, I'm not fully explaining this process since I assume most viewers don't care, so if you've never bled brakes before, don't assume this video gives you enough knowledge to do so. With the belief that I would at least have working brakes for the time being, I could move on to finally removing my makeshift gas can, hopefully for good. But I didn't throw it out. Murphy's Law, you know. From there I ran a new hose under the engine to the line from the tank. I have no idea how the factory did this actually, but what I did was far better than when I got the truck. They simply ran a hose over the top of the intake valve cover, across the spark plug wires, and down to the fuel pump. I'm quite certain that's not how the factory did it. Here I'm removing the kinked and bent remains of the fuel line to the car. I'm glad to finally see this fire hazard go, along with the hacked-in fuel filter that was rubbing on the valve cover. I had to dig out the actual tubing better to make a new line, as the 5 16 inch line is too rigid to easily bend nicely without one. And this line will be visible, so I wanted it to look slightly better than terrible. The key to doing a nice job of this is to carefully measure and mark for the bends. But I always plan to wreck at least half the lines I bend. The pump end of the line was then cut to fit, and another small piece cut out to allow for a fuel filter to be installed. Here's how it all looks under the hood. It's certainly not perfect, but it's far better than what was there. The clear fuel filter is also nice to be able to monitor what comes out of the tank, as I know I didn't get it perfectly clean. Then it was time to fire her up and see if anything leaked. And everything looks good. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to see more of this project or you thought it was interesting, why don't you do me a favor, hit the like button, maybe the subscribe button, never know, or go put something in the comments that you want to see more of this. If you do, I will film more of it. If nobody cares, well, maybe I won't. Thanks for watching.